pengalaman. Uh, it's it's a bit uh, ironic, really. We're meet, having this meeting in uh, anatomy because, of course, you know, as any good surgeon would tell you, if you need to understand how to deal with a disease, to cure a disease, you need to know what it is and where it comes from to start with. And, and fascism really is, is such a disease, it's, it's something that we have to know what it is in order to really deal with it effectively, because it is a deadly disease, it's, not some, it's something which every time ends in death. And so therefore it's absolutely vital that we have an understanding about it. And, um, Fascism itself was officially born, that what, what we understand to be fascist, the first fascist party was officially formed on the 23rd of March, uh, on a Sunday the 23rd of March 1919, and it was formed in a, in a room uh, in the Milan Industrial and Commercial Alliance Centre. Um, and it, uh, it made a declaration, its declaration was this, uh, we declare war against socialism because it has opposed nationalism. That was the first founding declaration of the Italian fascist party. And the word fascism, of course, derives from the Italian word for bundle, um, from the fascism, which was a bundle of sticks in which there was an axe in the centre. And that was seen as and, and was the symbol of authority in ancient Rome. And that's where the fascists drew their name from, that they were to be an axe. An, uh, 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 an organisation of authority. And I, I want to look really at the, um, uh, at, the, at the roots of Italian fascism to start with and where, where, where it came from. You see, Italy at the turn of the uh, 20th century was a society which was, uh, or, or a state which is very much divided into two parts. In the, in the north, you had a heavy, heavily industrial, very modern, uh, uh, modern society with a, a sig very significant <coughs> and combative working class. In the south of Italy, you had a very underdeveloped region where there were still effectively semi-feudal uh, relations of production. And it's a society in which there were huge levels of conflict. Um, for example, in the, in the June, just before, June 1914, just before the outbreak of the First World War, there was a virtually, uh, a virtually insurrectionary general strike breakout. A general strike which saw hundreds of people dead. I mean, you know, I know I'm sure most people here were out on uh, Thursday, on the 30th. Uh, I doubt very much, and I've not read any reports yet, that the police opened fire on any demonstrations. They did in Italy in 1914. And um, a man called Benito Mussolini was a, a member of the Italian Socialist Party, and he was on the extreme left of that organisation. And uh, he, he regarded himself as a, a revolutionary socialist. He said he drew his inspiration <laughs> from amongst others Karl Marx. And um, this is what he had to say about the uh, onset or the likelihood of war, in it, uh, which would drag Italy into it. He said, the national flag is for us a rag to plant on a dunghill. Now that's Benito Mussolini, who would become later on the douche, the uh, dictator, the fascist dictator <coughs> of Italy. And um, he became the editor of the Socialist Party's newspaper, Avanti. And, um, however, in, as war broke out, and it wasn't just Mussolini incidentally, but all the Socialist Parties throughout Europe, all the Social Democratic Parties, which had pledged their opposition to the war, as a war which would be worker against worker, we're internationalists, we cannot support a war, began to flip. One by one by one, they fell in line with their own ruling class and came down on the side of the war. The Italian Socialist Party actually was one of the exceptions. It didn't do that. But Mussolini, as the editor of the paper, went over to the other side and he produced a, an editorial in which basically he, he said, and it, it, on October the 18th, uh, without informing his colleagues, um, Mussolini published an article which had the title From Absolute to Active and Working Neutrality, uh, in which he claimed that the war had to be um, an anti-German, uh, an anti-Austrian war, uh, and absolute neutrality, he argued, meant coming down on the side of, of the war. And for that, uh, he was effectively expelled 
from the Socialist Party. He set up his own uh, paper called Il Popolo d'Italia, and my apologies to anybody, you know, I mean, I suffer unfortunately from uh, the British disease of education, uh, and therefore my command of languages isn't particularly great, but uh, he set up his own newspaper, uh, which was heavily financed by uh, sections of the Italian arms industry, and um, he, he began to agitate around the issue of the war and in support of the war in amongst the uh, nationalist fervour which began to it, uh, uh, develop in Italy. Now the war for Italy went not particularly well actually. I mean they didn't succeed in, in their gains in terms of growing, expanding Italian uh, uh, capital interests etc. And Italy, like just about every other country in Europe, at the end of the First World War, was engulfed by the revolutionary wave, which of course uh, reached its pinnacle with the victory of the Bolsheviks in Russia, but which swept right across the whole of mainland Europe. And it affected Italy hugely. Um, there was a massive move to the left. And I, I, I want to give you, really, a, a, a flavour of how, how far that pushed Italian society and politics to the left. Because in the 1919 elections, which were held in Italy, the Italian Socialist Party, and bear in mind the Italian Socialist Party is the equivalent of the British Labour Party, it went into those elections with a manifesto which stated this, the proletariat must be incited to the violent seizure of political and economic power. And this must be handed over entirely and exclusively to the workers and peasants councils. Um, its slogan in the election was all power to the proletariat united in its councils. Quite a distance obviously from Ed Miliband uh, and the British <laughs> Labour Party. But you can get a sense therefore of how far the whole of society had shifted to the left. How revolution, the prospect of revolu socialist revolution was on the agenda to the extent that even the Italian Socialist Party, a party which had a, a, an extreme left wing, a revolutionary wing, and a right wing, was nevertheless prepared to put that forward as its manifesto. And they did ex exceptionally well. They bought triple in that election. And it was the left who began to benefit from the crisis of Italian society at the end of the First World War. The fascists, which had already been, as I say, uh, established, did particularly badly. Mussolini stood in, in Milan and he got only 5,000 votes out of nearly 300,000. The fascists were a marginal force in a situation where the whole of Italian society was virtually on the verge of revolution. And in August, the revolutionary wave hit the factories of the north, in particular around Turin and Milan. There were strikes which then moved from being defensive strikes to offensive occupation of the factories. And in a period of, a, of less than a month, there were 280 factories occupied in Milan, 200 factories occupied in Turin. There were workers' committees set up. The factories were defended by armed workers' militias called the Red Guards. Italy, apparently, or seemingly, was on the verge of a revolution just like the one that had taken place in Russia. Now, I haven't really got time to go into how and why that revolution or that revolutionary moment, that possibility, never came about. Needless to say, I have to say that Whereas in Russia, the party which espoused the slogans I've just mentioned about all power to the Soviets actually meant it, the Italian Socialist Party leadership did not. And consequently the opportunity was lost and the factory occupations were defeated. But it didn't mean, of course, that the Italian working class suddenly thought that it was destroyed or hope was gone. The vote of the Socialist Party continued to rise and the left continued to remain a serious problem for the Italian ruling class. But it was at the point when workers had actually missed the opportunity to take state power that the fascists began to make their move. I already mentioned that the Mussolini uh, and his group had received 
funding from the uh, from from various uh, armaments uh, manufacturers and, and so on, sections of the ruling class began to see a real prospect, obviously, of revolution, and therefore looked to a means to destroy the red danger, as they saw it. And they began increasingly to look towards the fascists because they lost faith in the existing bourgeois parties as a means of dealing with the militant revolutionary Italian working class. Now, the fascists, when they had been formed, uh, comprised of a mishmash of uh, various groups. Uh, most significant were ex-soldiers, um, people were called uh, Diti. Uh, these were mostly officers who had felt they'd been betrayed in the war, they felt at a loss to know what to do, they felt they hadn't been rewarded for their efforts in the war, and they were obviously...